Welcome to Somerset Chambers of Commerce, the Future of Business 2021. If I may, I'll just introduce myself. I'm uh, Stephen Hennigold, CEO of Somerset Chambers of Commerce. A little bit of housekeeping for today. Could I ask you to uh, put any questions that you have for the Q&A session at, at, uh, in the um, chat box? Um, uh, Alistair Tudor, who's running the, the Q&A session, will pick those up. And also, could I ask you, unless you're speaking, to turn your microphone off? Uh, if I may, I'll just touch through the running order of today. Uh, Sri in Cheshire, Chairman of Barclays UK, uh, followed by David Barrier, Head of Research for the British Chambers of Commerce, followed by Dr. Adam Marshall, uh, Director General of the British Chambers of Commerce. Uh, and when our three presenters are finished, we will go to a Q&A session with Graham Austin, who is Head of uh, SMEs for the Southwest for Barclays. So uh, with no further ado, if I may, it gives me great pleasure to introduce you to Sir Ian Cheshire, Chairman of Barclays. Thank you, Sir Ian. Thanks very much. And uh, thank you, Sir Ian, for inviting me. I'm really glad to have the opportunity uh, to be back talking about the future of business and how we particularly rebuild the thriving local economy in Taunton Dean and Somerset. We're very glad to support the quarterly economic surveys uh, across 2020. And we're going to talk um, a bit later about the results from uh, Q4 uh, in, in, uh, in 2020. And obviously these are incredibly challenging times and we're very keen at Barclays to make sure we stay close to what's happening on the ground and use surveys um, like the QES and, and our data to make sure we understand what's happening so we can respond. Uh, just briefly at the national level, we've put 26, nearly 26 and a half billion into the economy through various government schemes, including over 300,000 bounce back loans and 10, uh, over 10 billion. So we think we've been very active um, in the, in the, for like the broad national campaign. What we're interested in is, is how we could be closer to the, um, if you like, the coalface and help uh, with businesses. And I know the QES has got quite a lot of references in it to the degree of pressure and challenge for businesses as they're faced with this, you know, once we hope in a lifetime experience. What I would say is that although there have been tremendous uh, negative impacts. I've been very impressed with the way businesses generally and in, in, in around Taunton Dean have been able to carry on and find ways. And we, from the Barclays point of view, have carried on, if you like, business support. And locally on the ground, we've been involved in um, healthcare business, making sure we could fund them to retain skilled staff, uh, a leisure business, helping them uh, basically fund PPE kit out, um, cash flow uh, support for people to diversify, one of whom won an NHS uh, contact. Um, contract. And then uh, in the middle of all this, we've seen technology businesses, one locally, carry on expanding. So we've been actually doing, if you like, business as usual. So I actually remain, despite the very dark days that we're seeing at the moment, optimistic about the future. And we, uh, last year, I had the joy of being down in Taunton Dean and, and uh, launching uh, one of our local, uh, thriving local economies project, um, which was a follow on from what we launched in uh, Bury and then in Kilmarnock, and we will be coming up shortly with uh, another one in, in Great Yarmouth, which will be announced next week. So we're carrying on despite this, really to help people understand each local economy is different, and therefore, how do we provide different support, the right support in the right place, and use the learning from places like Taunton Dean to scale up a national effort, but based on, on really solid local understanding. Um, so I was down there um, and I had a great trip out to uh, certainly the biggest strawberry farm I've ever seen at Braden Softroot Farm, uh, which was over in Isle Abbots. Um, I wasn't expecting to eat strawberries that time of year. And then we had the uh, launch at the uh, cricket ground, the very famous cricket ground. Um, I think what was impressive to me about that was how interested people were, all the local stakeholders, in coming together to make sure that we could find the right interventions um, uh, to, to really help the Taunton Dean and local Somerset economy. And I, I, although we've had quite a lot of challenge with COVID because it's meant we couldn't do some of the things that, that we would like to have done, particularly in terms of particularly local personal interventions, uh, we are very keen to continue our support in, in the local area and to continue um, uh, our work. So we've done, uh, for example, Barclays Life Skills Programme has been in with year nine pupils across Taunton Dean. Uh, and in addition, we were hoping to provide much more local network support We've done a series of virtual workshops, uh, which has been particularly focused on rural economics uh, and, and uh, seminars on things like the agri-tech area. Um, but we would hope to come out of this, uh, uh, of this sort of COVID period with even more enhanced um, local, local support. So 
Um, I think if we, if we sort of talk about what we need to do going forward, um, Barclays in the local, thriving local economy is very committed to learning how can we support an economy of the type and scale of, of Taunton Dean and Somerset with its particular needs. We will hopefully have a chance to sort of re-engage more on that. In the meantime, I think what we want to do is share some learning and, and share that knowledge of what's going on from the QAS on our own data. And I think Adam will talk a bit later about sort of what some of the future businesses. I'd be very interested in, you know, uh, in hearing what you and others have got to say, Adam. But my takeaway uh, from what we've seen in the crisis is that it's put a huge premium on the value of flexi flexibility and adaptability. And for some businesses, they've seen 10 years of change land in six months, and they've had to really rethink what is possible and what is not possible. In, in some cases, uh, that's been very difficult. In other cases, people have discovered new opportunities they didn't know existed before. And one common theme we've seen through all the work that, that's been involved is people having to think much more about digital business models. Um, it's always been around, but now more than ever, and particularly being able to create businesses from home, uh, businesses that don't rely on, on previous sort of uh, models, uh, and reaching out to customers who are in many cases very willing and keen to support local, local businesses. So flexibility and speed of movement. Um, the businesses that have, I think, found it most difficult, uh, and I speak as a sort of you know, former, former retailer really, are those who have been locked into difficult long-term leases, uh, even with the government's help on business rates, um, and who haven't been able to therefore reinvent themselves. Those that have been more online, more digital, more service oriented have been able to do extraordinary things to reinvent themselves. And that is a real tribute to the um, SME community um, nationally and, and in this area. So we, um, we have seen some great examples of, of businesses pivoting, changing business models, moving out, moving quickly. And anything we can do to help support businesses to become more, even more dynamic and find the opportunities, because even in this difficult time, there are definitely are opportunities, and support people through the mind the gap period I think we're, we're facing. I think the, the opportunities for business coming out of this will be interesting and varied and, and actually potentially turbocharged, because just to conclude that the thing I've taken away from both Barclays and, and certainly some experience of BT and other businesses I'm involved with, is people have found they could do much more, much more dynamically, you know, including taking 25,000 people and making them work from home in the space of two weeks. If we can do things like that, what else might we be able to do? So the positive from the pandemic, I think, is we've changed the art of the possible and we've recognised the value of flexibility and quick movement and being brave to, to make decisions. Uh, the, the challenge remains that we still need to fix some of the longer term things for thriving local economies, particularly the skills and the local network. And I want to finish by saying that Barclays are absolutely committed to the further investment in the Thriving Local Economies project and understanding how we can best support. Uh, if you've got individual questions about the Barclays uh, particular uh, um, sort of contribution, then Graham uh, Austin might be the best person to talk to, but I'm really thrilled to be here today uh, and really um, you know, salute those of you that have, have had to deal with this extraordinary awful episode. And hopefully we can see maybe H2 next year, um, some, some sort of opportunities and some reasons to be cheerful. So thank you for that. And I'll hand back to Stephen. Thank you, Serene. I too remember that wonderful evening uh, down at the Somerset County Cricket Ground where, where we met and there was a huge uh, number of businesses and stakeholders attending. Uh, and I too share your optimism for the future. I think uh, there is some optimism to be had. Um, in, in that way, I'm now going to hand across to David Barrier, uh, who will run through the British Chambers of Commerce quarterly economic survey quarter four results. Thank you, David. Brilliant. Thanks, Stephen, and um, good to see you all. Uh, thank you for inviting me to talk here. So I'll just give a quick overview of really the key headlines from the quarterly economic survey um, for Q4. We released the data last week. We released the national headlines last week. Um, Somerset, of course, are an, an enormously important uh, part of that process. Um, obviously, uh, we rely on businesses to complete the survey we, the survey is only as good as the as the, uh, the the quality of the responses we get back in and the quality is always very high from businesses so i want to thank you all for those that have participated hopefully you can all see my screen now um if not please shout um so just a bit of context uh before i touch on the key headlines um 
the QES is arguably the most important independent business survey in the UK. Um, it's a simple survey. It just asks businesses uh, how things have changed over the last three months, how businesses expect to see things change over the next three and 12 months. And um, from that, we can get a very general understanding of the, the structure of the UK economy for the quarter. It's worth pointing out, of course, that we, we are capturing general trends. So particular businesses may, might have seen an, a fantastic quarter or a terrible quarter. But what we're capturing is the general trend for the, for the, uh, for the bulk of the respondents. Um, the key objective of all of this is to create better business policy. Uh, so we brief the Bank of England, we go into the Treasury Department, we speak to Bayes on a regular basis about the data, what the data is showing, uh, with the view to providing the best possible evidence base to them so that they can make better decisions. But obviously we also use it to position the Chamber Network uh, publicly and here are a few press cuttings from last week's um, press release that went out. Interestingly, we got quite a lot of international interest. So the Washington Post ran the story uh, last week as well as the national uh, press in the UK. In terms of the QES for Q4, um, we received 6,200 participants, around about half say that they export. That there's about 75% of firms in the service sector, 25% in the manufacturing, so it's a good split. And overwhelmingly SME, small and medium-sized enterprises, 95%. Uh, crucially, the fieldwork took place in, across November, so that's worth bearing in mind for context. And as I say, what we're looking to test is changing sales, changing cash flow, investment and recruitment, etc. The fieldwork obviously closed before the announcement of the vaccine rollout and obviously things have been moving very quickly. Um, so again, we're not going to be picking up very minute um, changes from day to day. We're looking broadly at the quarter. So in terms of the key headline for Q4, what uh, I think summarizes it best is that we've seen um, no substantial improvement um, since the, the the fall that we saw in Q2. So in Q2 2020, the first survey that took place after the COVID-19 economic crisis really hit, we saw the, the, the largest declines in the history of the data set going back to 1989. Q3 and Q4 are not showing substantial uh, recovery for most firms. Um, but I think the key theme across all of this is that the sectoral impact is enormous. So you'll see uh, both from the Southwest data and the national data, uh, business, consumer facing firms, hotels, hospitality, catering are performing or have been hit far worse than professional service sector firms, construction firms, etc. So there is uh, a key dif uh, divergence to draw out there. And, and I think one of the key themes actually from the, the quarter was around uncertainty. Uh, business, we, we collect uh, hundreds and hundreds of comments from businesses and this is arguably the, probably the most important um, aspect of the survey to understand what's going on in detail and the key theme that businesses kept telling us was uncertainty and broadly speaking there were two buckets of uncertainty uncertainty around the around the EU UK trade uh, terms of trade and that involved concern about how the t uh, changes to the trading relationship with the EU might impact them. So what are the possible new rules, obligations and costs that they face? Um, but then you had a sort of wider package of uncertainty around COVID-19. So for example, businesses were telling us they're uncertain about the rules and obligations, what lockdown policy should entail, what it does entail, whether it's consistent across regions. Um, but then longer term, businesses were telling us um, from a range of sectors, they were concerned about changes to consumer spending habits. So what happens after the uh, crisis is over, is there still a viable business model to persist with? And what happens with government support? Is that going to stay in place and support me? So those are the sort of very broad headlines that we found. What I'll do is just quickly touch on three themes, one around just general business activity in the quarter, looking at sales and cash flow, another around recruitment, and then a final one around investment and confidence. So looking at what's happened in the immediate quarter um, to sales. 
what we find here, this is a graph going back to 2017, showing the answers to the question. So uh, we asked businesses over the last three months, have your domestic sales increased, remained the same or decreased? The, the same structure applies to most of the questions in the survey. So this will be a familiar graph. Um, what, you, what you saw in Q2 very clearly uh, was an enormous surge in businesses reporting that they'd seen a decrease in sales. Uh, this was completely unprecedented in the survey. Even going back to the recession of 2008 uh, we hadn't seen the scale and the velocity of the decline that we saw in Q2. Um, you can see previous to Q2, things were relatively stable. Um, but then obviously Q2 came along and, and sort of changed that fundamentally. In, Q2, uh, in Q3 and Q4, those two subsequent bars, we're, we haven't seen a uh, substantial change. The number of firms reporting worsening conditions has fallen, but it's still around almost half of firms reporting worsening conditions, which is still substantially above the pre-COVID levels. But as I said, um, the uh, key factor here is the sectoral divergence. So this is the data split by the sectors that we measure in the survey. And you can see that hotels and catering firms, for example, are coming out far more affected than other sectors such as construction or professional services. So in that um, sector, 79% of businesses have reported worsening sales compared to 43% as a whole. And then the number goes down quite a bit for say construction sector firms or professional service sector firms where only a third really have seen a decrease. So the imbalances are pretty big. And um, the same goes for, the, for, for firms responding in the Southwest. So here's the data, but uh, split, focusing on uh, firms in the Southwest in particular. And again, this is a broad sectoral split, but you can see clearly what's going on. Uh, business to consumer facing service sector firms, hotels, catering, retail, are clearly coming, uh, re more likely to report worsening conditions than say manufacturers as a whole or B2B service sector firms as a whole. So I think we, we really need to draw out that story. Um, we also look at uh, cash flow as well. I think this is an important measure. We ask businesses if they've seen a change in cash, uh, cash flow in the previous three months. Overall, 43% of firms say that they've seen a worsening in cash flow. But there's also another um, dimension here, which is that smaller firms are more likely to report worsening cash flow than larger firms. So you can see here, micro firms, 51% of those firms are saying that they've seen a decrease in cash flow compared to around a third of larger firms. So there's also uh, there's, there's a sectoral divergence that has emerged, but there's also a business size divergence that has emerged that's, that's really important to draw out. So that those are some of the key stats on business activity. Looking at recruitment and employment, what we find in uh, Q4 is that there's gradually more firms looking to recruit or attempting to recruit than there have been in the previous two quarters. So again, Q2 saw an enormous decline in attempted recruitment overall. Um, that started to pick back up to, to some degree, but you'll, you'll see that, again, the sectoral um, split is the most important thing to look at here. So while there has been an improvement in attempted recruitment in Q4, it's not coming through, again, for hotels and catering firms. 78% uh, of those firms are, have not even attempted to recruit. But then public and voluntary uh, sector firms most likely to recruit. 67% of those firms are recruiting. So, so what we start to see is how um, the crisis is impacting certain sectors. Certain sectors, um, such as logistics as well, transport and distribution, we've, we've off, uh, in, since Q2, we've seen that they've been slightly more likely to recruit than other sectors. They've sort of fallen back to the average now, but you, you, start, you start to see very early on that there were certain sectors that saw the uh, demand emerge for certain types of labor and completely close off in other sectors. So looking at the Southwest uh, recruitment picture and uh, as well as looking at capacity utilization here, we see really, I mean, uh, the, the Southwest follows the national trend fairly tightly. Uh, so there isn't a huge 
divergence here. Southwest firms on the whole are slightly less likely to have attempted to recruit, but not by much. Um, and in terms of firms at full capacity, only about 32%, 31, 32% of firms overall and in the Southwest say they're at full capacity. So most are not at full capacity. So there isn't a substantial difference between the Southwest figures and the national figures there. As I say, um, across all regions, the key uh, differences are between sectors and sizes. Finally, looking at um, investment and confidence, um, <clears throat> what we find here is that there has been an increased uh, number of firms expecting an improvement to their um, confidence, uh, to their turnover confidence over the next 12 months, which is good. So again, we saw um, a record decline in Q2, a record percentage decline of firms expecting their turnover to increase. So this is more of a longer term confidence measure. But in Q3 and Q4, that has improved. So we've gone from only 25% of firms in Q2 expecting their turnover to increase up to 40 odd percent in Q3 and Q4. So there has been a rise there, but there is still uh, an issue that this is nowhere near the uh, pre-COVID levels where you'd regularly get 50 to 60 percent of firms expecting turnover to increase and only about 16 percent of firms expecting it to decrease. By contrast, in Q3 and Q4, still about a third of firms overall expecting things to get worse. Um, and again, I'm, I'm sort of labouring the point here, but the, the sectoral um, split is the key thing to look at here. Hotels and catering firms, uh, the majority of those firms do not expect turnover to increase over the next 12 months. So they're, they're still pessimistic, both in the long term, in the short term and in the long term. Whereas professional service sector firms, lawyers, accountants, finance, etc., they are the most likely to expect turnover to increase. So you see how different firms are viewing um, the longer term picture as well. Um, and again, in, in, the, in the Southwest region, um, we also see the same picture emerge. So this is the, the same question here. Uh, do you expect a change in turnover over the next 12 months? Manufacturers, B2B service sector firms, it's looking relatively healthy. So we're starting to see a pickup here of firms expecting long-term growth. But again, uh, the issue sits with uh, consumer facing service sector firms, e even in the Southwest. So same, same story as the national. So where 45% where of the B2C firms are still expecting uh, a worsening in, in conditions. So really um, I'll, I'll, I'll just stop there. The key takeaway for me, really, looking at this data, and again, 6,200 6, responses, very strong sample from across the UK. The key takeaways really is that most firms on the whole are still not seeing recovery take place. In fact, still a very substantial number expecting the situation to get worse. But that masks the, set, the underlying sectoral and business size breakdowns where you, you, we, we, as policymakers, as businesses, we need, we're going to have to identify um, how different businesses are responding to this crisis. And I don't think there's a one size fits all view of, of this. So uh, I'll just leave it there and, and hand back to Stephen. Thanks. David, thank you very much. Just a quick question uh, that we've been asked, David, the cutoff point between micro and small, is there a number in terms of that, please? Yeah, so micros, we look at uh, any business with fewer than 10 employees, and then small is 10 to 49 employees. So we measure it by a number of employees. Fantastic. Thank you, David. Uh, and now it gives me a pleasure to hand across to Dr. Adam Marshall, who is Director General of the British Chambers of Commerce. Thanks so much, Stephen, and thanks to you and your team for hosting us here today. Um, you've heard from both Ian and David already, I think, a masterclass, both on some of the big picture issues facing business and some of the, the data and detail that we at the BCC are bringing together uh, about the national picture. Um, so what I'd like to do, if I can, for just a few minutes is look a bit towards the future. 
uh, what does the next year and beyond hold for us in our business communities? What are some of the challenges and opportunities we've got ahead? Um, and can we start raising our horizons from the firefighting that we need to do today, this week, this month, to the longer term as well? Um, You'll be uh, rather amused to note, David should close his ears for a moment, that my team prepared me some notes for today's event. Uh, but because of the completeness of both Ian's and David's uh, presentations, I'm going to set those aside, actually, and, uh, and give you some more extemporaneous reflections, if that's OK, um, about what I see and uh, where we're going from here. Um, so, so first of all, and I think very importantly, um, there are some massive challenges that we're all facing in the short term, and I don't think that the UK government has as yet grasped the severity of some of those challenges. And the big one for me, which, which uh, Ian and colleagues in Barclays will understand uh, as well as others, is cash flow, cash flow, cash flow. Businesses are facing and will continue to face a pretty significant working capital crunch for as long as restrictions are in place that prevent them from reopening fully. Um, I'm always struck by some of the examples that David raises about businesses that are technically able to be open but have absolutely no demand, so might as well be shut. Um, and uh, unfortunately, there are so many firms across a range of different sectors facing this constraint on their operations right now that cash is going to be a major subject of conversation over the course of the next year. Um, I mentioned working capital because obviously that's the thing staring us all in the face, but also there's a question looking ahead about growth capital as well. Where is the money going to come from to help those businesses that are able to reestablish their demand um, move forward and make some of the investments that are needed in order to maintain their market position or indeed to grow it? And I think we'll be talking about this a lot. And I'd like the Treasury and the Chancellor to be talking about it a lot more than perhaps they have in recent months. Um, because otherwise we're not going to see the pace of recovery that we want to see. Um, I think we also have to deal inevitably with the end of the Brexit transition and its impact on our businesses over the course of the next year too. Uh, very glad to see the UK and the EU achieve a trade agreement at the end of last year. Seven days notice is not enough time for any business, whether big or small, uh, to assimilate that and put the right procedures and processes in place, particularly for those who are moving goods around, but also for those in services sectors who depend on mobility, who depend uh, on understanding the regulatory environment in which they're operating, etc. It's going to take some time to settle this new UK-EU relationship. Um, and that, of course, is going to have some impact and some turbulence for so many of our businesses over this year. Uh, the big bang that people were thinking about on, on the 1st of January with uh, you know, lorry chaos and various other things didn't materialize. Uh, the reason for that is because a lot of businesses took steps to avoid that period. Uh, and because a lot of companies had stockpiled prior to the end of the transition period. But that's not to say that conditions aren't difficult and that there aren't some problems still to come. And as we're seeing with supermarket supply in Northern Ireland, for example, or many other issues besides, there is turbulence still there. So over the course of this year, we do have this barrier and this challenge to adjusting to this new relationship. Our call from the BCC side is for the UK and the EU to see this as a foundation for their trading relationship, not the sum total of our shared aspiration, and to build on it from here, to go back to the table, to be pragmatic, to talk about what more we can do together to keep trade flowing, whether it be in services or in goods. Um, and I, I think we should be avoiding wherever we can uh, divergence for symbolic sake or for ideological sake, uh, you know, the power to diverge from the EU uh, at, at the end of the transition really is around um, the sectors of the future, to be nimble, to be fleet of foot and to be agile so that as new types of businesses come around, we establish the UK as the best place to grow those businesses. It's not around what we've already got, and it's not around some symbolic challenge to Brussels right now. I don't think that would be helpful for any of our businesses because it would just destabilize the deal that was painstakingly agreed at the end of last year. Um, there will be other areas as well where we'll see some unforeseen consequences. Rules of origin for anyone trading in goods have all of a sudden become really, really important again. 
Um, things like mobility and whether someone's professional qualifications get recognized will be important again. And we will be talking about Brexit and the outworking of the agreement, not just for the next six to 12 months, but probably continuously, albeit at a lower level than we had previously for some time to come. So it, it will be part of our rebuilding story as we adjust to this change. Um, when we get the economy restarted and going again, I think we're going to see some differences depending on places too. I think you and Somerset actually have some advantages in this respect. Um, you have not had uh, the level of dependence, for example, on a major city center as a key part of your economy and seen that key area of your economy shut down to the extent uh, that we have in places like London, Glasgow, Manchester uh, or Leeds. Um, we have, uh, you know, town and city centers that are going to need to restart. They're going to look different. Um, you know, Ian mentioned, uh, you know, the work that Barclays is doing on thriving local economies. Well, the shape of those local economies and the way we use our places is going to be different as we come out of uh, this experience. Uh, some of the trends that we'd seen, for example, on retail and the changing environment around retail were accelerated tremendously. Our working patterns, as Ian mentioned, have changed, but we don't yet know where they're going to settle. And I think this is going to be an important part of the story over the next couple of years. There are people out there in the media and the world of politics who declaim, yes, we know exactly what's happened after the pandemic. We have no idea. It's going to take a long time for us to see whether the pattern for some people will be three days in the office and two days at home, whether it will be entirely flexible and agile or something else in between. And I think we have to live with the fact that we are in a period of transition and uncertainty insofar as how we work and how we use our places. Uh, we shouldn't be building business expectations that, 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 that will be, for example, back into town and city centers in month X and everything will go back to the way it was before, because that's not going to be the case. There's going to be a period of change and a period of adjustment. So those businesses that are able to be nimble, and those businesses that, that understand that flexibility and agility need to be part of their future business planning and that resilience needs to be part of their future business planning are the ones that really are going to succeed. Um, when we look to the, the, the future, and just, just finally on, on this place element, I think those areas where you have residential property together with commercial and industrial property and amenities all within a 15 to 20 minute radius, you will see places thrive. Somerset is lucky in that context. You have a lot of communities that would fit that description. I think you'll be hearing a lot about the 15 minute city or the 15 minute town in, 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 in years going forward. Um, so in a sense, you have a good starting point in the county to build and become more resilient as we face this future of, 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 of change and difference. Um, but then when you, when you move on from some of the changes wrought by the pandemic to look towards the future, I think one thing that's very clear to me as I conclude my time as Director General of the BCC in the next couple of months is how important a forward plan is for the United Kingdom. Now, I'm sure we can discuss this, you know, a little bit later on, but my, my view is that the UK government does not have a coherent economic plan for the next 10 to 30 years as to how the United Kingdom could develop. I think there are some plans around things like net zero and lower carbon technology. I think there are some plans uh, around a few sectors of the economy where, where governments have uh, long focused their attention, but there isn't an overarching plan as to what kind of economy we want to build and what kind of country we want to see. I think that's going to be critically important to getting both our domestic businesses and international businesses to invest in this country. We need after five years of instability plus an unexpected pandemic to have a great degree of stability and foresight over what's coming ahead in so much as we can. Um, so this goes down to things like, as I was saying earlier, making the UK the jurisdiction of choice for new and growing businesses, the place where the regulators are fleet of foot, where the investment climate is really good, um, and where the tax environment as well is appropriate so that companies can grow here and really invest here. I think this too looks to things like human and physical capital. 
you know, I want you to have the A358 upgrade completed, but that is not the sum of my my ambition for you in, 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 in Somerset. I think, you know, we should be talking about how public sector capital investment in our infrastructure, whether that's physical or digital, uh, will set the groundwork for a competitive country going forward and make that commitment to keep investing in that and crowding in the private sector investment and those companies that will then come in off the back of it. But none of that's going to have the benefit that we want to see if we don't have people with the skills base that will help make those businesses happen and make those businesses grow. So getting to a point where we stop talking about our skills and training system and actually shift it so that it's really responsive to the needs of businesses in, in our communities um, and that people have the ability to retrain as they shift perhaps from one sector where they've had parts of their career to another um, and, and being a place where we don't change the rules of the skills system every six to 12 months, but keep it in place for a long time so that everyone grows in confidence that we are uh, the place in the world that is building uh, the best human capital will be critical. Um, and then I suppose finally, uh, Stephen, if I may, um, I want to say something about chambers of commerce in all of this. Um, I think we've seen over the course of the pandemic that community matters and that business is an incredibly important part of community. And that is the living incarnation of what a chamber of commerce represents. Um, coming together as a business community to have a shared voice, to trade together, to help each other and to help the place where we do business be stronger and better and more resilient. That mission is going to be more important than ever as we come out of this. So whether it's Somerset Chamber or one of the other 52 across the UK or one of our 70 British chambers in, in markets across the globe, coming together as businesses to solve problems um, and to try to make the world better for businesses and for people in our towns and cities is going to be absolutely critical. So to end on an optimistic note, I think that the golden age may be ahead for chambers of commerce and that mission of civic business coming out of the time that we've just lived through. And I look forward to discussing that and much more over the coming minutes. Thanks, Stephen. Thank you, Adam. And I too share your, your view in a very optimistic future. And also I think in terms of opportunity, um, we're now gonna move to our question and answer session. Uh, our three panelists uh, will be taking those questions. Uh, Alistair Tudor, just go through those. And also um, Graham Austin, Barclays Head of SMEs for the Southwest. So if I can move across to Alistair and we can start to review the questions that have been placed in the chat form. Thank you, Alistair. Um, thank you very much for a very interesting discussion. Uh, first question is going to be for Sirian Cheshire. So uh, Sirian, I'll, I'll hit the spotlight you uh, and then I'll, I'll ask the question. I've got you on doing that and I'll ask it hopefully. Um, in terms of the recovery, you, you mentioned the recovery in the second half of the year. Um, what do you think that this will look like um, and where do you see it start to sort of emerge first? Where, where do you see it starting? Okay. Well, look, echoing what Adam says, I, I think you've got to treat all of this with a high degree of uncertainty, but there is no doubt uh, at this point, I can make sort of two predictions that I'm relatively comfortable with. One of which is there is no doubt there is a pent up demand in certain sectors in the same way that the uh, crisis has hit much more brutally uh, hospitality, travel in particular, and some of the B2C um, facing customers uh, operations. There is a huge desire for people to get back to quote unquote to some form of normality. And I think you've already seen it this morning with <laughs> stories about people booking holidays, the over 50s being confident enough about vaccines to start booking holidays for the second half of the year. Uh, so I think you will see pent up, um, you know, if you like, deferred or, or frustrated spend bounce back in some of the areas that actually have been worse hit. You know, sadly, for some of the businesses in hospitality, that will come too late. And, and actually, oddly, I think what it'll mean is that for those that are able to survive um, and prosper, they're, they're, they might do even better. So it'll be a, a quite a big rebound, I think, personally, in some of those areas. People haven't lost the desire to go out to restaurants and pubs and hotels. Um, but I think the other thing, which is harder to gauge, is that the, uh, the uncertainty that Adam and others referred to meant that households have built up a huge um, reserves of cash at the moment. Actually, also um, businesses have built up huge uh, deposit 
balances and they've got to start being invested somewhere. So I think there's a, a quite a, a decent chance of a six month spending bounce. And I don't think it's going to sort of change the sort of period, maybe over sort of two, three year period, but it, it will give us, I think, a quicker recovery out uh, than, than we've seen. Um, the caveat is that, you know, what we don't yet know is how many of the businesses that have been really stricken will will get their way through. And to echo the point on cash flow, it's all about surviving through to some form of normality. And then some business models sadly have gone, you know, and, and certainly the big, big, a lot of the big retail town centres operators, obviously I you know Devon's and, and Devon's very involved with previously the head office at Taunton. There, there is unfortunately, I think, you know, some serious casualties involved with this. So I think you can see an uneven picture, but a big splurge of, government, of, of consumer spending. And then probably to Adam's point about the lack of a national plan, I think we will start to see more targeted efforts from the government to get a build back better, build back green and build back regionally. Uh, and the final point I make is actually, I think potentially Taunton Dean and Somerset generally are actually well positioned now for people who decided that 15 minute um, city idea that Adam referred to, but also that people can run businesses from all sorts of places and what they value is the community, the space, the green opportunities. And actually, I would be more confident about the opportunities for, for, for Somerset generally in the next sort of three to five year period uh, than many other parts of, of perhaps say sort of big inner city. Um, so I think we're going to see a bit of a splurge, um, a return of confidence, and then ultimately it will come down to how much business investment we see. Lovely, thank you. And, and I guess following on from that, we've got a question from Stuart Pierce. Again, it was for you around, uh, do you feel that businesses will um, embed and embrace these changes, these digital solutions that they've come across? Uh, or do you think they'll ditch some of these things? Where do you, where do you see the changes staying and sticking in the recovery? I really hope that businesses learn from, from what, what's happened and in some sense customers have had an unexpected 10 month digital training experience which I think has changed the world. So a lot of businesses, even those in, you know, go back to hospitality sector, it sounds very physical, they've got to be there. Actually they've learned how to reach out um, to stimulate traffic through digital channels which perhaps they wouldn't have done two or three years ago. I think there are whole new business models coming out now in terms of people being willing to interact digitally and we'll see things from health to financial services. We've seen our customers much more willing to discuss things over a video link than they would have done before, and much more aware of their own uh, opportunity to drive their life um, through different sets of technology. So for all the businesses, I would assume that people, yes, they'll go back to the pub and the restaurants, but they've learned a lot in this last nine months about how things can be different. Uh, the working patterns, we won't see how they'll settle down but I'm sure that will produce some di different uh, different opportunities and the consumer um, B2C and B2B I think will be much more digitally driven than it was before. Thank you. Um, potentially a question for Adam this one. Uh, you obviously mentioned uh, the impact on Brexit. Um, we're going through this transition period at the moment where, where we're getting used to these new kind of trading conditions and, 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 uh, and paperwork and, and, and documentation. Um, do you think that we'll have that all sorted by the time that we recover from coronavirus or do you think there'll still be ongoing issues with Brexit? Um, I think there will be ongoing issues because there are so many elements of unfinished business in the agreement that the EU and the UK reached at the back end of last year. Um, businesses will get used to filing customs declarations, for example, uh, that they will, you know, that's something that is going to be required for moving goods across borders. I think they will get used to, to that. Um, I think they will also eventually start to get to grips with some of the rules of origin uh, that are included in, in this uh, deal as they are in other free trade agreements around the world as well. But it's if there's any change to processes and procedures. So, for example, if the EU side decided all of a sudden to change the way it handles agricultural checks or SPS checks, as they're known, that could create some additional complexity. 
Um, if uh, the customs rule book changes in the Republic of Ireland, in France, in Belgium, or in the Netherlands, again, you could see uh, businesses having to make further adjustments to their procedures. So I think the new relationship with the EU needs to settle as much as it can, but we have to realize it will always be dynamic at the margins and there will be probably some continued change and some unexpected sources of friction that will affect businesses. The reason why we're arguing that the UK government and the European Commission should remain at the table pretty much permanently is to try to seek to, to mitigate and, uh, and reduce those sources of additional friction where they can. Um, we would hope that they would both take a pragmatic approach, which is in the interests of traders on both sides. Um, and when it comes to services, I, 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 I mean, the sky is the limit because there's so little in the agreement for services uh, that there's still more big deals that could be done between the UK and the EU to enable service providers to trade uh, across borders successfully. Um, so it's going to be a long term thing. If you look at the relationship between Switzerland and the European Union, um, the, the EU was adamant that it did not want another Switzerland, someone that it was in constant uh, communication with and constantly negotiating with. Well, I'm afraid that's exactly what we've got coming out of this is a UK that will be constantly negotiating with and updating its trading arrangements with its closest neighbour. So Brexit may fall away from the front pages, but it will be a continued business issue on all of our risk registers for some time to come, I think. I wish I could be more optimistic on that point, but I think that's just an admission of the reality that we currently face. Yep, absolutely. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask this next question verbatim because we're a non-political organisation. It's, it's actually from Graham Crosby, who's our, our chairman of the Somerset Chamber of Commerce or chair of our board. Um, so the question is, if we take Sir Ian's observation, the lockdown, long -ter lock term lock-ins prevent agility and responsiveness to the COVID crisis with Adam's comment that we can't expect to return to town and city normality to be part of the recovery. From a political perspective, how can these be reconciled without causing massive structural damage to local economies and jobs? So I guess this is around, you know, in, in terms of the recovery, how do we balance this out? and what, what should we expect from government? Adam, you might be in a position to answer that one. Goodness, th th this, is, this is an incredibly difficult one because it feels like you're treading into the territory of very big public health decisions and whether there is in some way a trade-off that someone like us can opine on between people's lives and well-being on the one hand and the openness of the economy on the other. I find that extraordinarily difficult territory and we as, a ch as Chambers of Commerce have tried our best not to engage too much on that front. Um, but rather focus on what can be done to help the economy and to help businesses get through this period so that we can reopen safely and successfully. The, the biggest danger, as far as we're concerned, is stop-start lockdown and stop-start business support. Unfortunately, we have both of those right now, and that's why I think that the impact on so many firms has been so catastrophic. Um, government decision-making is, sort of, is sort of catching up to uh, the events and the data rather than rather than trying to get ahead of it. And I think that is a big source of difficulty for many of our businesses. Um, one of the best ways you could get around that, I think, is if you said, here is the plan for support, financial support for businesses for the whole of 2021. If the Chancellor stood up tomorrow and said, we recognize that this crisis is going to take a little while to resolve. Um, we recognize that whilst we may come out in the springtime of some of the worst lockdown restrictions, that there will be unexpected things hitting our businesses and our communities over the next six to 12 months until that vaccination is widespread enough that we can reopen the economy fully. So therefore, I'm setting out this threshold for support for businesses in terms of cash flow support, job support, etc. for the remainder of 2021. We think that would be a mature approach rather than drip feeding measures every month or two that you know someone stands up and says here's a little bit more support for businesses because it would give people the ability to plan uh, through an incredibly incredibly difficult year one where as ian was saying previously a lot of companies are running out of puff having run the marathon and with the finish line in sight they just don't have any cash left and they can't keep going because they haven't got any demand if you offer that support out they may get over the finish line and then be able to uh, recover and get some electrolytes back in their system and a space blanket over them now that they've finished that marathon. Um, so more consistency in policy making and more consistency in support. 
because quite frankly, and I say this to, to government ministers when I see them, hope is not a strategy. Hoping that the vaccines have an impact by the spring does not constitute a strategy for supporting businesses and the economy through this difficult time. Yeah, maybe if I could I'll just add in a, a quick point, which is in terms of the structural shifts, we were talking about things like town centres. I, I do think one of the things that's going to have to happen is um, a willingness to give local leaders more tools to be able to reshape their local town centres um, around planning, transport, uh, access, um, you know, the, the willingness, frankly, also of landlords to look at different structures for leases, uh, all of which is about building back flexibility into what have become, in some cases, very rigid structures in property ownership, which meant that it was very hard to change use, for example. I think we'll see a, a very different uh, set of town centres with, unfortunately, some casualties and blocks of people who will find that the business they used to work in has gone, but they will find other things. And, and the challenge, I think, for the leadership at, in community levels is to try and work out what can we do to maximise the redeployment of space people assets into the industries that will flourish in the next five to 10 years. And business is always about continual reinvention. Where it gets difficult is if it becomes stuck in arrangements which can't change. And I think the previous assumptions about how you manage town centres, you manage local economies, and, and hopefully we can support this with you know, thriving local economies, is to say, look, everyone's got growth opportunities. What we've got to do is help figure out how do we remove barriers to being adaptable and flexible because the best form of resilience is the ability to change. And, and I guess a, a question maybe for you and, and Sir Adam as well. There's a question from uh, a number of businesses. Um, Stuart Harris has asked, do you think there'll be more funding for businesses to make the transition to digital? If we're going to hang on to a lot of these um, updated working practices that we got, do we need support, do we think? Are we hearing that from businesses? Well, Adam, Adam can come. I mean, my, my comment would be... Uh, his point about stop start is that the business um, business support has been seen through a sort of uh, lens of the crisis which is how do we just keep everything going what there isn't necessarily is the strategic thinking about what we want to be and i would have said that digital skills are you know probably the single biggest area that the government should be investing in uh, i wouldn't frankly be holding my breath for a lot of support on on, on that front because i think the government is beginning to count the costs of all its various forms of support and it's going to get a little bit um, constrained in what it can and can't do. But if I had to pick an area for Adam and others of us in the business world to lobby the government about, it would be precisely in that area. Adam, anything to add on that? Yes, no, I mean, I, I, I do agree with, with Ian. I, I don't think we're going to see lots of cash handed out to businesses after the immediate crisis is passed in order to adapt or change. So I'm setting my sights more on making sure that businesses can choose to invest their cash resources in the adaptations that they need rather than pay it all over to government. I'm very worried about the tax environment when the, the crisis, the immediate crisis comes to an end. We have successfully, I think many of us lobbied the chancellor and others not to start r raising taxes immediately because it could kill off the recovery. But I'm very worried that the government has a manifesto commitment not to raise taxes on individuals. So who will it go after? It will go after entrepreneurs who have built businesses over the course of their lifetime through capital gains tax. Um, rises. It might look at business tax rises of a variety of descriptions. We already know that the self-employed are going to face higher national insurance contributions because of the support that they've been given during the crisis. My fear is if we end up as a high tax, high regulation uh, environment, um, we won't get either the homegrown businesses or the international investment that we know we're going to need to succeed. So I'm less focused on what money gets given to businesses in future. I'm more focused on how businesses can keep more of their own cash in order to reinvest and be incentivized to invest in growth, in innovation and in change rather than anything else. Well, you've, you've created a beautiful segue there, Adam. So thank you very much. I've got a question from Nigel Hatfield saying, expanding on the call for a plan for the UK, would you like to see incentives offered to companies to invest in UK manufacturing? 
Oh God, yes. Yeah, um, <laughs> that's, a, that's a simple one, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, there, there, there's so many places you can start with that. Okay, let's start with business rates. Uh, it's completely insane that a manufacturer that improves their premises faces a higher property tax bill the next year, uh, when that premises improvement might be contributing to productivity, it might be contributing to a more competitive business, et cetera, et cetera. We need to remove plants and machinery improvements from business rates bills. That would be one incentive right there. We should, we should blow the doors off on the annual investment allowance for companies that, that, that have capital. You know, Ian mentioned that there are a lot of companies that have quite a lot of money on their balance sheets right now. You want to encourage them to invest that money. Well, I mean, there's, they're, they're, not, they're, not, they're not making any interest off of it if they've got it in cash, that's for sure. Um, and they're, they're, they're losing the value of it. So, so you know, why aren't we massively increasing investment allowances and capital allowances for businesses so that they put that money here in this country and build more competitive manufacturing facilities? So I, I agree completely with the point made by the questioner we should be doing that sort of thing getting those incentives in place for the medium term yeah let's uh, let's bring the conversation a little more local um i want to bring in uh, graham austin uh who's head of smes for barclays in the southwest um we've been asked a question um simply one word well four words tesla our big opportunity question mark uh graham can i ask, put, put, put you onto that one please yeah, I mean, if, if any, anyone has got Mr. Musk's phone number and would like to give him a call to, to talk him into the benefits of, uh, of coming to uh, the Gravity site, then, you know, I, I think absolute game changer, both in terms of you know, inward investment profile, highlighting the, the, the area and, and what's available. Um, I think, you know, I, I don't know the detail of it. I haven't got his phone number, but... Uh, uh, maybe someone at Barclays has so uh, let's see what we can do but um th the thing is I think if you look at that in terms of the type of size of site that he's looking for and the and the connectivity that he that he wants it, it must be on a short list somewhere so I'm hoping we're still in the game somewhere and uh yeah as, as it says on the questions uh, yeah a, a big opportunity um yeah without question okay um, following on from that, Graham, I know obviously you're very heavily involved with the Thriving Local Economies project um, in Taunton specifically. Um, what are your plans for 2021? I think we were, um, we, we were all caught in terms of uh, having to stall a bit of what we wanted to do for, uh, for the Thriving project uh, with, with the COVID. Uh, we were taking advice from our external think tank, Demos, to say what were the real needs locally. And how could we get uh, you know, the best impact for what we're going to uh, roll out locally? Um, that obviously stalled. Uh, we've done a fair amount of things over the um, over the uh, year, uh, but uh, mainly virtual. Uh, we have got a few things coming up. We, we're doing more deep impact involvement with some uh, uh, very vulnerable children in the area. Uh, we're taking that up via a an external charity uh, with the help of uh, some Barclays staff to really act as mentors for those those young people coming through the education system and hopefully uh, onwards. Um, uh, we've got uh, some interventions which we're looking to uh, roll out. So we're hoping by the end of Q1 we can take stock of the impact of COVID and what we could actually deliver for, for best impact locally. Um, but in my day job, which, uh, you know, I am head of SME and my one of the biggest things is to support SME. Uh, just a couple of points on that. Sir Ian mentioned about the amount of lending that we put out under the government schemes and particularly in the SME space, uh, the real volume is in the in the bounce back loan scheme, the sub 50,000 loan. Uh, you know, we've put out about a third of a million loans, which is an incredible number, but we've actually got a million SME and small business customers in uh, Barclays UK. So we're only supporting a third of those. So one of the big things within quarter one is while the government schemes are avail available, really making sure that my team are going out there on an education process to reach out to those uh, small businesses and actually say, are you sure you, you, you don't need these government schemes or they're available? So that's the big thing for, for, for quarter one is to make sure uh, that we've had the discussions, uh, particularly around lending, uh, but also around the whole Brexit bit uh, and if necessary, bringing in some support from our international services departments to really try and talk people through the practicalities uh, and how we can guide or help specifically for those. Uh, someone's mentioned about lending. Um, one of the programs I am looking to bring into place in the, the, the Somerset area is a funding ready program, which I'll share with the chamber when that gets released. And that's a virtual program 
with businesses looking to transition either from a smaller business to a larger one or, or a different project that someone said. And, you know, everyone says about bank lending. The trouble is if I lend money to a business, the first month I want to start have some repayments back. And that's very difficult when a customer is either pre-revenue or pre-profit. Uh, so under the Fund and Ready program, we will we'll start to look at people's uh, business plans uh, and uh, what their needs are and try and bring in a whole host of different things that can start to guide them. Uh, you know, banks aren't the only provider of funding. And as Sir Ian said, there is a significant amount of capital out there uh, I saw my particular business in the southwest, a massive growth in the debt position last year, but a corresponding nearly equal growth in the credit balance position. So there is cash out there. Okay. Uh, so those are my priorities for Q1. Excellent. Thank you. Um, we've got a quick question from, uh, it may not be a quick question. We've got a question from Simon Barker, who works for our, our business partner, Leonardo Helicopters, who are based down in Yeovil. Um, he makes the point that bigger businesses are already making decisions about their revised working practices as a result of COVID. And I think it's quite a lot of them that have, have, have stuck with what they're going to do. Maybe the smaller business is slightly more agile. Um, but he's got a fear that the, the you know, the, the, the short term analysis of the situation is maybe hiding this kind of slightly ticking time bomb around um, mental health, well-being, talent, especially the younger talent. Those of us with children of the school age um, understand the pressures of trying to work and, uh, and balance an education when, when, when everybody's at home. Um, welcome really the panel's views on that um, in terms of how we address those longer term uh, issues of mental health, well-being and talent. Adam, can I start with you? Thanks, Al. So it, it, Simon's asked precisely the right question in, in, in my book, which is, are we taking knee-jerk decisions too quickly? Uh, you know, and as I was saying earlier, on a process that is certainly incomplete at the moment. We, you know, we don't know where this is all going to land. Um, I think the best thing that businesses can do at this particular moment in time is not to take definitive decisions that will trap them or lock them in to a new way of working or a new strategy for, say, 5, 10 or 15 years. Um, but to take the decisions that they need to for 2021 with the flexibility to alter as they learn. And any business that is uh, dealing with this particular set of challenges right now that isn't spending time and making space to learn from its experiences is really missing a trick. And I know there are a lot of firms out there that are just changing things when they have to, but they're not stopping and reflecting and saying, here are the impacts that we've seen on our people. I'll give you an example, you know, from our own business, and David can probably corroborate this. Um, you know, people were pretty happy early on that they didn't have the commute to deal with. But then they noticed that their working hours were expanding, and they noticed that there was no division between their working time and their home time, because they were always accessible. Because in the midst of the crisis, we were having conversations at 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock at night, because something was happening with the government, and people were back at their desks at 7.30 the next morning. That is sustainable over a short period of time in crisis, but it's not sustainable for the long term. And if we hadn't stopped and reflected on that and tried to put some rules in place uh, in order to manage that, I think people's mental health would have been affected hugely. Um, the only other observation I'd make is we're social animals at the end of the day. We like being with other people. And we've learned that doing what we're doing today on Zoom, whilst good, is not a replacement for being physically together in different places. So I think the workplace of the future may not be about doing your day-to-day -day work, but it will certainly be about getting together and having the time to brainstorm, to think, to, to read other people's body language and to, to, to talk about issues and to do some of the pastoral care that is so important in our businesses as well. Uh, so the office or the workplace is never going to go away. It might be become the, the place that we gather rather than the place that we sit at desks, however. If I could just build on Adam's comments, which I completely agree with, just to take one theme, which is the mental health at work uh, dimension. I, I generally believe that we've not seen the true impact in terms of people's mental health. Uh, there's an awful lot of people in their homes, uh, frankly, suffering at the moment. We, we've seen a massive uptake at, from the Barclays end of our employees in terms of the mental health portal. And I do think, particularly for the SME community, there's, there, there is a real challenge uh, in this area. And I, I do think businesses have got to slightly uh, pivot in the next six, 12 months and understand that they have got, even in micro businesses, a responsibility for our, our colleagues uh, to help them through this. And the assumption is, 
you know, somehow some, uh, someone else's issue. I, I don't think it is. In the same way that businesses need to play a role in the community, we need to take responsibility for our colleagues' well-being. Um, and if I could uh, sort of publish one, one thing, there's a very good, um, involved with a thing called Thriving at Work Leadership Council, which is about mental health work. But the mentalhealthatwork.org.uk website has got a great set of resources, which is specifically also designed for smaller businesses that don't have big HR departments. And if I could make a plea for people to really check in with their teams, uh, I think as we emerge, and I completely agree with Adam, I think there'll be a, a settling down period. We'll do more, we'll be thrilled to see each other again, and then there will be probably a bit more homeworking than we have before, but not necessarily a reversion. But I think the scars that people are carrying from some of the, the anxiety and depression and some of the people also being bereaved, there is a big job to be done. And, and I, if, you, if you need help on those, uh, I'd, I'd urge you to look at the website uh, and get all the help you can because we all, we all need to help each other in this uh, next phase. Absolutely. Okay. Um, thank you all. I'm, I'm going to have to wrap up the questions there. Um, there are some great questions. So thank you very much to, to everybody that's asked. I'm going to hand back to Stephen Hennigold now. Thank you, Alistair. Um, my closing remarks are, first of all, a thank you to the Barclays team. A thank you to Sir Ian Cheshire. Thank you to my colleagues, David Barrier and uh, Dr. Adam Marshall at the British Chambers of Commerce. And most importantly, thank you to you, uh, the Somerset Chambers of Commerce members. We are a member-based organisation and you are constantly uh, and always there and we are here to support you. I'm delighted that we're able to have some of the, the largest numbers of contribution QES, and David smiling. Uh, and I would say to you, thank you very much. Um, I know firsthand, having spoken to Andrew Bailey, Governor of the Bank of England, and listening to some of the conversations, both at HMRC and the Treasury, that the information that you, as a Somerset Chamber member and Somerset businesses, contribute to the QES that goes into the wider British Chambers of Commerce QES survey is read, is digested, and is used by, by central government and these organisations. On that note, I would remind you to say, uh, 15th of February 2021, the QES quarter one is open and look out for that. That will be coming through your email and delivered to you. And if I may just touch on a couple of upcoming events from Somerset Chambers of Commerce uh, during January. Tuesday the 26th of January, there are two events. Uh, the first one is Breakfast with Somerset County Council. Those of you that have joined us before will know that's our starting January for the County Council to have a Q&A and just bring you up to speed with everything from traffic infrastructure, investment, and I've no doubt this time about the deployment of the COVID vaccines. On the same day, Tuesday the 26th of January, uh, we have the European Union transition event, uh, threats and opportunities. Both of these details can be found on the Somerset Chambers of Commerce website. Uh, and finally, on the 3rd of February, we have the MD CEO Forum, those of you in that position, MDCOs, uh, you will know that that's very much Chatham House rules uh, and you would be welcome to join me on that. Um, finally then, a massive thank you to our panellists, uh, to, to you, our members. Uh, this has been a Somerset Chambers of Commerce production. Thank you.